Coding Train <laughs> live stream from New York City. Now, I just want to mention that in a couple minutes, I have a very special surprise guest. So don't go anywhere if you were going to go anywhere. But even before that, uh, I'm going to premiere for you the new um, um, a channel, trailer, vi music, video, coding train, theme song thing. Uh, I'm going to premiere that for you right now. I'm kind of just checking to make sure that people are hearing and seeing me. Um, you will see that for about a minute and then I'm going to get started with today's coding train live stream thing that I'm doing. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's find something we want to make, some crazy idea. We'll figure out what it takes to make that dream appear. We'll try to understand now as we ride along again. Now hop on the coding train, coding train, coding train. Come along and join us as we light it up in code. Using only our imagination as the All right, <laughs> thanks for watching that. I, it had been a long time since a, at least like 50 to 100 people in a row had written cringe into the chat. So I felt like I needed to have that video uh, premiered in order for that to happen. That video will soon be available for you to watch as many times as you want uh, as soon as I make it public. So um, you might be wondering what it is you're watching. Uh, this is The Coding Train. It is a live stream that happens usually every week, every Friday. My name is Dan. Schiffman, I think that's the correct pronunciation of my last name. And I'm not entirely sure what I'm gonna to do today. I have a few ideas of things that I want to catch up on and code, mostly uh, pretty beginner friendly stuff. I know I've been getting this a lot. I started a few JavaScript machine learning tutorials. I didn't get very far with it. I had this bicycle accident. <laughs> um, and I've been getting just about every new video that I publish and in the chat, I've been seeing people write, when are you gonna do when are you gonna do the uh, machine learning again? When are you gonna do the machine learning again? When are you gonna do the machine learning again? I will at some point try to get to that, but I have a special surprise because I am not a machine learning expert, but I have a machine learning expert that you may or may not recognize right here in the studio today <laughs> to answer some questions and maybe show some stuff and just as like a fun, let's experiment with having a live guest. So what I'm gonna do weirdly is I'm gonna take this microphone off because I, I only have one microphone and I'm going to present my surprise special guest right now. <laughs> Hello world, it's Siraj. <laughs> How's it going everybody? <laughs> so I'm gonna, guys, Siraj is here, yay! Uh, yeah. Round of applause for the live here studio audience. There's no live studio. There's no live studio audience. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to let Siraj have the microphone take over. It's a, it's a like, what's that, like Snapchat takeover? Is that a thing? Snapchat, it's, it's probably a thing I don't know, somewhere. I'm old, so I don't know Snapchat. You don't know Snapchat yet. There's, there's definitely <laughs> Snapchat somewhere. But this is like a takeover, and so I'm going to let Siraj talk, and what I'm, I'm going to awkwardly stand here, because I can look at the, and I'm going to monitor the chat. And I will pull interesting questions from the chat. And if you want to show anything or talk about anything, there's a computer here. There's a computer, perfect. <laughs> so I have the computer access. I've got, uh, I've got you guys, and I've got a, bu a bunch of stuff. So uh, let me just answer some questions. So if anybody has any questions, just put them in the chat. I'll, I'll answer them. They could be about machine learning, uh, anything machine learning, and of course, personal as well. But so, I am. so one thing I'm saying is a couple people in the chat are saying, oh, I don't know Siraj. Okay. So even though I think, oh, everybody must watch Siraj's YouTube channel, yeah. maybe you don't. I guess so. So uh, why don't you, can you take a minute just to introduce yourself and maybe pull up your YouTube channel? Let me pull up my YouTube channel. Good, okay. Good promotion. The little self-promotion here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, okay. Straight to the, not to the music video. Let's just <laughs> go to the channel. Okay. Oh no, we're showing an ad by we're showing an This ad. happens all the time. Okay. Uh, okay, guys, so I talk about artificial intelligence on YouTube. I'm like, Dan and I are very complimentary. He, he does the more JavaScript and I do Python, but we can switch back and forth. 
But basically, I talk about AI. That's my thing. I talk about AI and ways that you can use it for recommender systems, uh, classifiers, data generators, uh, anomaly detectors, anything that you could learn from data from using AI, that's what I talk about. So uh, this is my channel. Check it out if, and you'll probably like it as well. If you like Dan's channel, we, we do a lot of similar stuff. So that's me. That's who I am. And I'm just visiting uh, New York because I'm talking with the uh, United Nations and came to collab with Dan as well. So now I'm going to answer some questions as well. And uh, so far the only two, first of all, some people are saying the mic volume is too low. So I'm gonna, you don't have to do anything about okay. that. I don't have to do anything. I have a ability to turn that up a little bit right here. So hopefully that's gonna help. I guess you could move it up a little higher. Move it up sure. a little higher, yes. Uh, okay, how would you deal with, I'm, I'm trying to get some of these. Uh, okay, how can you use LSTMs to classify data? <laughs> that is a great question. What, so first of all, what is an LSTM? Great, also a question. LSTMs are, it stands for long short-term memory networks. So LS, an LSTM is a type of neural network, right? And neural networks are the the foundation behind why AI is so popular these days. There's so many different types of neural networks. It's, there's, a, there's a zoo of neural networks. In fact, there's a literal zoo that we can look at here. And this zoo just shows a diagram, check it out, of all the different types of neural networks. There are feed-forward networks, as you can see here. There are recurrent networks. There are long short-term memory networks. There are all sorts of networks out there. There are even lesser known networks like Hopfield networks and Boltzmann machines. So if you're getting into AI for the first time, you might be asking, should I talk about, should I learn about deep, should I learn deep learning first or should I learn machine learning first? And the answer is, the answer is you should focus on deep learning first because almost 95 or 99% of the time, neural networks will outperform any other machine learning model almost all the time. So once you get really good at deep neural networks, then you can focus on the other machine learning models like support vector machines and uh, linear, regress linear regression, stuff like that. But you can do all that stuff with neural networks. They're, they're an incredible technology. So deep learning is like a subcategory of machine learning? Or does yes. It, uh, and would you say that everything that's deep learning is also machine learning? No. No. So it's a one-way <laughs> yeah, one relationship. Machine learning is just a, the collection of all learning algorithms that you can use to gain insights from data. So all, and so deep learning is taking one of those models called a neural network and giving it two things, giving it rocket fuel and a, and a rocket engine. What do I mean? The rocket fuel is the data and the rocket engine are GPUs. So if you give it a lot of computing power and a lot of data, a neural network will help you find insights you didn't even dream could be possible. And you can do this with a bunch of uh, cloud platforms. Not everybody has access to amazing GPUs, but Google Cloud is obviously a great solution for this. You've got Microsoft Azure, but I'm, to be honest, I, I don't like Microsoft. If you're, if you're a Microsoft person watching this, it's okay. You know what? I found out that Microsoft has the biggest contribution to open source out of all of the big tech companies. So that's pretty cool. I will say, I just, Windows XP and Vista just left a, a scar on my heart that hasn't gone away. <laughs> anyway, um, and Cortana. What about Windows 95 was good though, right? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I guess back in the day, I, I was pretty young, but yeah, yeah. anyway. All right, I'm, uh, here's a good, uh, I don't know if you were still going, but I have no, a couple go for more it. questions. No, go for it, go for it. So one question I think is good. So if you want to get into AI and deep learning, what kind of math knowledge do you need? And do you need to like go and learn the math first and then you can get into it or can you kind of learn it at the same time? It's a great question. And, and I would also like to know the answer. For this sure. This is the kind of thing that I'm trying to, one of the things that I'm trying to do on this channel, I just mentioned. So if you're interested in deep learning and machine learning, you should really just go check out Siraj's channel, especially if you want to see all the latest frameworks and work with Python. One of the things that I would like to try to do on this channel to complement what Siraj is doing is make some really beginner friendly AI machine learning tutorials um, that you can kind of do quick in almost toy-like experiments in the browser with JavaScript. So anyway, that aside, so I'm kind of curious trying to figure that out. Like, well, what do you really need to know? Can you just 
get through, through this stuff without knowing this. So that for sure. Background, what's, yeah. Uh, so I, I had this problem too, right? Like if you look at a lot of these machine learning courses, all you see are equations, right? Like mostly equations. And as programmers, we don't actually deal with equations whenever we're building anything, right? We're, we're dealing with code. And sometimes we'll deal with some basic operations like add or subtract, but we're not computing derivatives, right? So you might be thinking, yeah, should I just go and learn all of calculus and all of the, no, the answer is no. These subjects, calculus, linear algebra, these are, these are massive subjects, right? And there are so many parts of these subjects that are irrelevant to deep learning. There are only very specific parts of calculus and very specific parts of probability theory and of linear algebra that you need to know to do deep learning. So you need a condensed version of these subjects. And the best resource, besides my channel obviously, to, to look at this, and this is kind of where I learned from, I kind of gleaned my knowledge mostly from this book, which is free, it's online, you can look at it in your browser, and it's called The Deep Learning Book. And the authors of these books are, first, are Ian Goodfellow, who invented uh, generative adversarial networks, probably the hottest idea in all of deep learning, and Yashua Bengio, who's one of the godfathers of deep learning. Uh, so definitely check out this book. It's, it's got like entire chapters dedicated to subjects that would otherwise be an entire textbook in and of themselves. Like, so in chapter two, you'll learn about all the linear algebra you need for deep learning. It's super cool, right? And so it starts off by saying, linear algebra is a, is a branch of mathematics used for this, right? I'm, I'm standing in front of it. And then, you'll talk, and then it talks, it, it's so cool, it talks about exactly the topics you need. You need scalars, you need vectors, you need matrices. These are all, you need tensors. These are all basically the same types of things, just sets of numbers. But it's our way of ordering these numbers together. Right, because that's what deep learning is. It's taking sets of numbers, matrices, and continuously applying operations to these matrices for every layer. And these are, in, that's why you need linear algebra because you can't just multiply a set of numbers. You have to compute the dot product. It's basically multiplication, but for a set of numbers. It's our, linear algebra is algebra, but for sets of numbers, right? So for groups of numbers. And yeah, you only need parts of linear algebra. Check out the book, uh, yeah. That's my answer to your question. Uh, so another question I think that would be useful is we ta you talked a little bit just now about, okay, well, there's machine learning. It's this broader uh, field of research, deep learning being taking one aspect of that neural networks out of it and giving it the rocket fuel, so to speak. Yes. What is AI? How, does that, how do you think of art? What is art the topic of artificial intelligence? How does that you differentiate that term or, or, and how does that, what's the difference between AI versus machine learning versus deep learning? For sure. So, okay. So yeah, there's a lot of confusion in this field. And if you look at any of these articles by these uh, popular tech magazines like Wired or TechCrunch, let me just look at one. So one of them is like, you know, just like Facebook uh, invents language or something. It's like Facebook and AI invented its own language, right? And so if you look at these articles, you look at them and you say, okay, what's the topic here? Facebook AI creates its own language and creepy preview of our potential future. Immediately show a picture of Stephen Hawking, who is completely unrelated to what Facebook's AI did. So let's just look at one more. And I haven't looked at these articles before, but let's just look at a, a single. I think they, they don't like it. No, it's a good call. <laughs> Facebook AI agents creating their own language is more normal than people think, researchers say. Okay, so this is actually a good, this is a, this is a smarter article. But basically, these articles take advantage of these terms that people don't know about and just kind of blow them out of proportion. So I'm here to just tell you this. AI is kind of like the biggest term, right? AI encompasses everything, right? Artificial intelligence. In some ways, you can even say what Dan is doing in terms of creative coding processing, that's AI. It's just intelligence, right? Intelligence is just, is, is, we are intelligent, right? It's the ability to learn. Okay, how can we learn, right? And so software is our way of automating this learning process, taking a, a bit of it, just a bit of what we can do, and automating it so it doesn't need a human behind it. Traffic lights can be considered AI, right? It's just yes, no, on, off. But in the end, AI is just the really big buzzword. And what we really want is artificial general intelligence. That is an AI that can do everything. But the way that we have found the best way, the best medium of making AI a reality is using machine learning technologies. And the most specific topic we can talk about of these machine learning technologies are deep learning. And so that's why 
deep learning is one of those hot words in the past in the past five years because only now have we started to get the computing power and the data we need to make these neural networks perform incredible things. So in order, deep learning is the subset of machine learning and then AI is the biggest circle around all of those things. And AI in general is the ability to learn. Some would even say it's heuristics. So any kind of statistical model, it doesn't have to learn necessarily, but any kind of intelligent algorithm. Awesome. Yes. So um, that was, I think, a good set of questions. Uh, like we could probably keep going and doing yes. this forever. Forever, yeah. Um, I, so I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to show one or more, talk about. Yeah, or? yeah, one more quick thing. Okay. I just, I've been learning about brain-computer interfaces recently, and there's this really cool, uh, there's this really cool uh, hardware device called the Emotive that it's, I think it's the easiest for developers to get started on. I know there's also OpenBCI, but there's a, there's, a, there's a hardware cost to building it. But Emotive is really just out of the box. The SDK is really, really easy to use. And you can use this technology. You, basically, you put it on your head, and you can control robots with your mind. You can lift up objects, like 3D objects, in a simulation with your mind. So think of the force from Star Wars. And I think the reason I'm mentioning that is because I think there's a lot of potential to apply machine learning to these technologies. And it's one of those things that no one has really done yet. So there's a lot of potential for a cool side project if you wanted to do that. Maybe combine that with some cool visualizations using P5. But uh, yeah, that's more or less it. I'm releasing a video on this stuff later today. So that's why it's on my mind. That was my next question. So you're, you're, usually you, I, I know you release videos Friday around what time? Around um, uh, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. E which is EST. just about now. So you're going to go downstairs and work on releasing a video right now? Yes, exactly. And, and what can you give us a tease? I guess is this the tease? This is the tease, <laughs> but Elon Musk's Neuralink and Brian Johnston Johnson's kernel and then Facebook's brain typing thing. I just, I'm going to talk about what this really is. And it's one of those really risky videos to make. But let's just do this. Awesome. So. Well, I won't get to watch it right when you release it, but I'm definitely going to watch it as soon as my live stream is over. Perfect. So I look for that. I'm going to, so I, everybody stay, stay there. I'm going to put on some waiting music. I'm going to mute the microphone for a second and help Siraj find his way out through into the hallway. <laughs> you can come back. I always wanted somebody to knock on the door and for me to just like open the door and be like, oh, hey, look who it is. But we'll have to do that next time. Yeah, next time, for sure. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to hit mute here. And we're going to go that way and I'll be right back. All right, that was fun. <laughs> I've never had like, I've had guests before, but never on a Friday and never another YouTuber. It's funny, like I, I saw Siraj when I, we haven't met before, but he came by and I was like, oh, you're, you're on YouTube. And I'm like, when people say that to me, oh, you can't hear me. Yeah, I my microphone. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me get the sound good. Mic up, mic up. Microphone swinging around. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ugh. Hold on, hold on, everybody. <laughs> I tangled this up. Can you not hear anything at all? Hold on. Okay, how is this? Okay, how is this? Mike is good, you can hear me, okay. Um, patron, Slack group, okay. There was just random sound of the mic. Anyway, I saw Siraj and I said, oh, you're that guy I watch on YouTube. And I was kind of excited. And then people say that to me and I think, don't be ridiculous, but then I had that feeling when I saw him. So I guess that, that's what happens. Siraj is great, it was really fun to meet him in person, super nice funny, charming, and I hope that we'll get to do, I, I would like to do more collaborations in general with people, and I hope that I will get a chance to do uh, more. Um, okay, I'm going to, oh, uh, Alka in the chat is asking, what bit rate are you set to? The, but, so one thing I want to say, 
if you can, if you can humor me for a little bit, this is the first time I'm using, let me, um, let me uh, uh, close these windows here. Um, this is the first time that I'm using Open Broadcast Studio instead of Wirecast. The good news is, remember how every week my stream starts to, my stream crash, crashes, and I have to restart it all the time? That shouldn't happen. Open Broadcast Studio seems to be working really well. It has some good features. I'm able to switch between shots really easily. That's the whiteboard shot, which the camera's off. Um, the downside is there might be some things that I don't, that are different or that aren't working or lighting wise. So please let me know uh, if, okay. So, um, so what I'm gonna check, because Alka is asking is uh, settings, output, bitrate is 2,500. Um, so hopefully that's okay. Um, but hopefully the quality is fine. I am willing to make changes to it. If there's something really extremely off, I would make changes to it right now. But if it's just like more like feedback for next time, uh, please just let me know. So a um, couple things I'll mention. If you would like to support the work that I'm doing um, and join our uh, patron group in the Slack channel, you can go to patreon.com slash coding train. Um, if you... Uh, you could get coding trade merchandise. I don't know why I mentioned these things. The links are all in the video's description. Um, oh yes, so are you seeing like twinklies, twinkling? There's an issue with, um, let me see if I can uh, fix this. There's, oh yeah, I have a bad HDMI cable. Um, and the, aud the audio is out of sync. Let's see how bad it is, because I actually adjusted and added a delay. Um, okay, let me clap. How bad is that audio sync? So Alka, I don't think that I could probably change the bitrate without stopping and restarting the stream, which I'm loath to do unless there's a serious problem. So I will just investigate uh, changing it to like 5K or something like that um, next time. People are saying the audio is synced well, a little off. A little off is no big deal, okay. All right, so um, I'm a little bit disorganized because I actually had a nice whole hour to get ready and plan what I was going to do. And then um, Siraj came by and I was like lost all of my time but because I was having such a fascinating, interesting conversation about YouTube and machine learning and coding. So I am going to, well, actually let me use the computer here. Let's, I wanna make a list of things that are on my mind to do today. So things that I would like to do. Oh, I forgot to have Siraj read the random numbers. Raj, if you're watching, you can come back upstairs and knock on the door. Um, but I was thinking, oh, if I ever have guests, they have to read the random numbers. That's like a thing. Uh, okay. So some things that I want to do. I want to talk about custom shapes. So one, the, I have two ways that I decide, three ways really that I decide what to do on a live stream. One is that uh, people make suggestions to the Rainbow Topics GitHub repository and um, you're, somebody please post a link to that in the chat and you're welcome to do that. Number two is I take suggestions. Oh, Alka is saying I can change the bit rate at any time. Okay, I'm gonna do that in a second. Number two is I take suggestions from the patrons. Uh, people have joined via patreon.com and from the Slack channel that we discuss during the week what topics would be interesting. You know, I don't know, patrons could keep me honest here. Do I really listen? I don't know if I really do a good job of listening to the suggestions, but I try to. Um, and then third, and this is, this is probably actually the most, the main uh, reason why I pick certain topics is that I am teaching courses at a program called ITP. It's here at New York University and there are supplemental things that come up in class or questions or things that I'm teaching about and I like to attempt to uh, make videos about stuff that's relevant to what I'm already teaching this week. So in that sense, I'm teaching a beginner programming class and custom shapes using uh, vertex and curve vertex has been a, a confusing topic this week. Um, I wanna talk about let and var and also const, ES6. That's something I might wanna do. Uh, a, a simple harmonic motion, uh, sine, motto, motion, sine, cosine. Um, I also was thinking about uh, 10 print. Um, and, oh, and then uh, data and APIs is in one of my courses too, so I was thinking about the Wikipedia API. 
and also maybe like uh, wind data. There's been a lot of hurricanes and there's a lot of research going on and discussion about climate change and so maybe projects that um, around that topic, uh, learning how to get wind data from maybe like open weather map could be relevant. And then of course, uh, continue <laughs> uh, matrix math series. So anything else that came up, <laughs> Simon is asking. So, uh, so Simon uh, did suggest, right, inverting, flipping a number. I, the reason why I asked you, Simon, about the bouncing ball uh, speed thing is I think I have a video already that, that does that inversion, but I do agree that that is a useful uh, topic as well. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. I'm sorry for forgetting it. So I'm looking at the chat now. Um, I, I feel a little bad. I think neural networks is turning into the Chrome extension thing, where it's like I say I'm going to do it, but I never get to it. Uh, yes, so Austin is suggesting classes, getters, and setters. This I'm planning to do next week. It just it hasn't come up yet in the class, and I want to um, I want to get to that uh, next week. So that's kind of on my list for next week. Um, and I, I, um, I also want to look at uh, in the future ES6 uh, promises. And there's another thing from ES6, like some ES6, maybe some of the array functions, and then at some point this like uh, ES6 arrow no arrow arrow uh, notation. Is that what you call it? This thing. So I want to look at all of those things as well. <laughs> oh, the name, uh, yeah, 10 print, uh, Topher in the chat says 10 print. The name reminds me of my first ever program I wrote in second grade. Oh, I forgot the book. I need my prop. I might have to run downstairs to get the book. Um, today's probably going to be mostly, oh yeah, Deep Space is suggesting to straw poll, <laughs> except everyone's going to do the matrix math series, <laughs> which I might not want to do first. Um, and I feel kind of committed to the first two. Um, all right. So while, well, actually, let's, uh, the straw poll thing is kind of fun. So let me, um, let's go to straw poll because I have some other things I wanted to talk about. So why not, I'm just curious. I'm not necessarily uh, coding train. Can I paste into here? No. Uh, I have to do it one at a time. Uh, vertex. Curve vertex, simple harmonic motion, 10 print, um, Wikipedia API, uh, wind, wind data from open weather map. What else? Uh, inverting, flipping number. I'm not so sure. I, Simon, I really like the suggestion. <laughs> I, don't know, I feel terrible that I'm like not, I keep like by accident not including it, but I also, I don't have it in my head exactly. Maybe what you should do is make a video on it for me and then uh, that'll help me understand what it is. Uh, but I will put that in the list. Uh, and then what did I miss? Let and var, oops. Uh, and then the problem, I was talking about this with Siraj. I don't feel very confident with the machine learning neural network and matrix math stuff. It's one of the things that I feel like I really need to like spend the day reading about before I come to do the live stream. So um, that's why I kind of, but I'm gonna put it on this because I'm just gonna see what happens here. We'll do have to do a runoff. <laughs> I'm gonna create this poll. Uh, so this is the URL for the poll. And somebody who has privileges, um, uh, BFDGH7DH. Uh, and now while, while people are voting there, I'm gonna talk about one of the things that's been requested a lot, and I'm really excited to talk to you about this today, is community projects. What does it mean for people watching videos on YouTube, learning about code, to collaborate together on a project? So I have two community projects um, and I also, uh, and, uh, that I wanna talk about. So the first one I wanna talk about relates to Processing Day. I've mentioned this before. Processing Day is an event that's happening October 21st at the MIT Media Lab. It is a day to celebrate the community that develops and makes stuff with processing and P5GS uh, and related things. Uh, you can see uh, all the people who will be presenting and talking. Um, I especially want to encourage you to submit a, uh, if you're coming, to submit a lightning talk uh, to present a short demo at Processing Day. But one of the things that I've been, I, I am planning to do something live. So the thing that I have thought about, and thank you to Taeyun for suggesting this, the organizer of Processing Community Day, is to make an algorithmic design for name cards. 
So anybody who signed up to attend will get a name card and one of the ideas was to put names in, on a cloud. So if I go to github.com slash coding train and uh, maybe I'll do a walkthrough later of this and I go to community clouds and thank you to me, I am so me. Me, I am so me is uh, helping me now to maintain a lot of the GitHub and code related stuff for the Coding Train channel. And me, I am so me created this really nice uh, system to uh, submit your cloud idea. So the idea is that, oops, you can take this as your inspiration. How would you design a generative cloud? in p5.js. Now ultimately I'll probably port the code to processing to generate the SVG files and these are going to be printed with thin black lines. So um, this is not about making a colorful uh, image but rather an algorithmic outline and the names will actually be written in calligraphy. So, um, so uh, if you are interested in this take a look at this repository. Um, I'm going to click here on it. it this repository controls a uh, GitHub Pages site and the, what you can do is you can submit your cloud, you can either work on somebody else's cloud idea or you can submit one by writing a function and naming it and it will turn up in this menu. So me, I am so me invented this wonderful system that I'm excited about to use for future collaborative projects. Um, and if I just show you really quickly, if we look at this code here, generators.js, all you need to do is go to this file and write your own function. So you can see this function draws a rectangle. Oh, and then oh, look at this. It's even so sophisticated that you can then return some values that, about where to draw the text. But that's an extra fancy feature. I love that feature. But really, you just need to write your own code here. Write a function. You know, I, you know maybe you want to try using Perl and noise. So you write a function called Perl and noise cloud. You register it and you register it with a name and the author and then you call this register, you add this register function, you submit it as a pull request and it will appear as one of the cloud options. So everybody, maybe I should do a cloud as a coding challenge, but that's what I'm gonna do at Processing Community Day. So, um, so that's one thing I wanted to mention. All you need to do is have a GitHub account and hit this edit button. Now I'm not signed in, so it's saying I must be signed in. And of course, you know, if you're wondering what's Git, what's GitHub, how could I possibly do this? You can watch my video tutorials about that. Um, Topher is asking um, what and the name is what drives the cloud shape. So this is a good question. I'm, I have to figure, we have to figure this out. I think the idea, if I'm really thinking about it, is just a system that generates a different cloud every time you run the code. And the cloud has enough space for somebody to handwrite a name in it. So you can think of it as like, there's a bunch of hello my name is sticker name tags that have a nice little generative cloud printed on them and you write your name inside the cloud. It, it'll, it might be something slightly different than that but that's a good way of thinking about what it is I'm asking for people to create and submit. So on the one hand this is a collaborative process and we'll maybe have a community designed cloud but uh, you can also sort of submit your own design and uh, you know obviously if we uh, try to make figure out some appropriate way to give credit to those who have submitted code in the actual um, uh, cloud design and if I do it as a live tutorial, I can maybe give credit during that tutorial. So please uh, let me know. Okay. Right, so this is an interesting idea. So on the one hand, this idea of generative name tags, go nuts with it. The name could actually, you're right, it could be the name that informs how the cloud, that's a great idea. So you should, we should try that. Um, that wasn't the original thinking behind the idea of the name tag because they're going to they're gonna be written in, but, um, but that's an interesting idea. I love that idea. Okay, so this is probably a terrible idea because I haven't launched a community code project really before. So this is really the first one that we're trying to do in a sort of formal way. So I probably shouldn't do two of them at the same time. <laughs> but because I did a coding challenge last week about making a clock, which I felt was, in my mind, very successful. I really enjoyed seeing everybody's clocks. And in fact, let's take a moment now to see some clock submissions. So last week I did a coding challenge about clocks and I'm gonna to go to rainbow code coding challenges and I'm gonna scroll, um, I'm a little bit bigger than I usually am, I'm gonna move this over. I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom and I'm gonna to go to coding challenge 74 clock and I am going to look at these clocks. Now I know there were many more clocks 
that people made and sent to me over on Twitter or via the YouTube, uh, YouTube comments. Um, so I didn't have time to kind of like try to find some of those and paste them in here. So I really encourage you if you want to submit your clock to this list to just do a pull request on this readme file. If you don't know how to do that pull request, send me a tweet and hopefully I can help you out. But um, let's look at some of them. So this is wall clock. So some, uh, let's look at wall clock. Beautiful. Lovely wall clock, very traditional. I love, oh, this is really interesting. These nice quads that are drawn sort of thicker at the, the top versus the bottom. It has a real like physical quality to it. This is really nice. Thank you for to whomever submitted this wall clock. Um, this is Andrea Douglas, digital seven segment clock. Let's take a look at this. Uh oh, yes, open the app. <laughs> no, let's come back to it. It might take a minute for it to get started. Let's look at uh, Kleine Filmrolchen. What's the chance I pronounced that? Uh, Oh, somebody in the chat is saying that that clock drew friction into the hand movements. Is that really true? Let's look back at that clock again. And by the way, this clock is uh, released through openprocessing.org, which is a great uh, website for um, sharing sketches and sharing code and that sort of thing. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that little spring action. That is fantastic. Those little details are really wonderful. I love that. Um, okay, so now, um, let's look at this circle analog clock. And oh, so one thing that would be helpful maybe is that when you submit it, submit a link to it running in the browser. Um, so, and one of the ways you can do that if it's just a, a sketch like this in a GitHub repository is to, um, is to make it a GitHub pages uh, site. So I don't know if this already is a GitHub Pages site. If anybody can help me figure out that link, I would love to show this one. Let's see if this one came back alive. I guess that Cloud9 thing is done. Let's look at this binary clock. This should be interesting to see. Oh, and this is made with JS Fiddle. That's kind of cool. So maybe I need to make this a little bit wider. So it looks to me like what we're seeing is binary notation of the current time. The current time is... 445. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> My brain cannot compute this easily in real time, but I love it. It's fantastic. Um, wonderful. Great job. Thank you to uh, Arjun. Now I'm going to show uh, Dolly's clock. Whoa, what just happened here? I clicked on it. This is uh, Dolly's clock, which is, oh, this is beautiful design. Now this is, is this a real... Am I just unfamiliar? Planetary gear logic from a pl processing sketch. Watch illustration and sketch file. So this is great. But one of the things that's really nice, first of all, this is a beautiful design. I love how much it like, really has this feeling of like a full watch um, in my web page. And uh, in my web page, <laughs> in the browser. And a lot of these would be nice Chrome extensions, right? For a new tab, Chrome extension, you make a new tab and it just shows you this beautiful uh, clock design. But one of the things I want to point out that Dolly's done, which is really wonderful, is reference every single thing that helped inspire and uh, um, uh, inspire her to create this clock. So one of the things I really encourage people to do is be really generous with credits in open source. So. Uh, always credit, you know, code where it came from, the tutorials that you used. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, there's actual real questions of IP and plagiarism, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about the spirit of generosity and credit um, is, uh, and I, you know, it's easy to forget and I've been guilty of this many times in the past. I try to do my best. Okay, um, let's look at, oops, uh, where are we? One more clock. Oh, Alka, this is Alka's uh, physics uh, or are there more pull requests? I don't know if, if me, I am Sumi, or anyone with privileges is, wa is watching this right now could merge some of those pull requests. I could log in over here and do that. I'm just not logged into my GitHub on this computer. So let's look at Alka's uh, physics-based clock. So this is wonderful. So you, um, so I guess I, it's up to me here to describe what's going on, but we can see here, this is, it is 447, and 16 seconds, and 18 seconds, and 19 seconds, and 20 seconds. I can't, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. So this idea of creating this physics simulation, almost Angry Birds-like 
tower structures uh, with the time is really wonderful. And I have a feeling that something exciting will happen when we get to 60 seconds. So let's wait. So this is, very, this is what I really love about the clock designs is you can be so creative and non-traditional. You can create a code version of your favorite clock or you could just make up something crazy that almost like it's hard to figure out to tell the time. Or maybe you make up something crazy that actually is a really excellent way of telling the time. Oh, there we go! There, that was really exciting. I have to wait. So I encourage you to, 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 to look at this on your own time. Thank you, Alka, for uh, submitting this clock. So let me look in the, oh, click and drag your mouse around the blocks. Oh, look at this. So I can also make all sorts of fun stuff happen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, okay, so I think I better start. Now, I have an excuse for not doing any coding for 50 minutes. I don't know how long this live stream has been going. Um, because, and let me try to, um, um, because I, um, I had Siraj as a guest for a little while. <laughs> Okay, time to do some actual coding. Um, let me just see if there were any more that were submitted. I could just look at the pull request. Oh no, let's look at the pull requests. And I apologize for not keeping up with pull requests um, on all these different repositories. This is one of the reasons why I asked BIM Sumi to help out, um, to kind of act as a de facto GitHub coding train Coding train GitHub pull request manager. And so we can see there is another one here. Uh, I don't know if P5 Dojo is a clock, but this is definitely a clock, my clock. So I can't merge this right now, but um, we can view it right here. And uh, okay, so let's look at this. I'm actually just gonna do um, something real quick. I didn't realize what web page I was going to. Oh, lovely. That's right. So you can see this is a really nice variation of um, the clock that I made with arcs and hands. But a couple things that are different. Number one is there's a, in, there's a hand that's doing once around for each second. There's a lovely little digital readout down here that's just some nice like little bouncing physics. And the, min, the second hands, the like sub-second hands, they're moving continuously as opposed to just like with mine, so that's wonderful. P5 Dojo is a clock, and it's from P5 Dojo. I haven't forgotten Simon about my straw poll. I'm gonna go look at it. <laughs> um, P5 Dojo is a clock, and P5 Dojo is also a person in the chat saying it is a clock. So let's look at P5 Dojo's clock. Uh, Chris Sturr Nielsen, it looks like. And I'm gonna go to Files Changed, and we can see here uh, P5 Dojo. Oh, there's two clocks, Bezier clock. Ooh, Bezier curves. One of these days I'll have the confidence to explain how Bezier curves work. Oh, I love this. So simple, so perfect. I can just enjoy this. So um, I'm kind of guessing that all of the points of minute, hour, and seconds are points of a Bezier curve. I just love the simplicity of this. Um, so, and very creative, thank you for showing this. Sharing this, and let's go to um, <laughs> all over the place. I, uh, um, let's go to, uh, I can't keep track of my links. Here we go. Let's go to this last one, QR clock. This is interesting. I imagine this is gonna have something to do with a QR code. So somehow this QR code is telling us the time. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So this is pretty hard to read. <laughs> For a human, but I guess a computer. That's a really cool, uh, cool, crazy idea. And we can see here the actual time is right there. Wonderful. Thank you for submitting these, P5 Dojo. Okay. Why was I showing you these? Well, one, I wanted to show you these fabulous clocks. I retweeted a bunch of the people shared with me on Twitter also, which was really exciting to see. And you know, we really should probably make a website that's just full of clocks. But before we do that, the other community project that you can contribute to is and thank you also again to me, I am so me for making um, this uh, repository is the 12 o'clocks repository. So 12 o'clocks is a uh, art artwork by John Maida from the late 90s 
all made on a, I think in this document, a Mac OS 9 and released in 1997. The only way to currently run these historical comp creative coding, this creative coding project from the late 90s is to get like a Mac OS 9 emulator or power PC. And Golan Levin actually did this for a page, a blog post for one of his courses at Carnegie Mellon University, where he got them all to run and then kind of made some gifts of them. So what I would love to do as a community is recreate this exact page, what we're seeing here, but instead of GIF animations, the actual clock's running in the browser. So what you can see here, if you read this readme, we'll give you more information. And if we look at the published uh, GitHub pages, you can see this is just um, a layout for all these clocks, but the clocks aren't there right now. So this is just a beginning. So I would love for us as a community, this is one of the inspirations for this, speaking of crediting, is the Recode Project. Recodeproject.org maybe? No. So hold on, Matthew Epler, Epler Recode Project. Um, let's, this is, this is a documentation page about it. Where is the actual link? That's Matthew Epler, who also, by the way, has all these great video tutorials on YouTube. How come I can't find the Recode Project um, website? Uh, someone's going to be able to help me to find this. Rec ah, here we go. Recodeproject.com. <laughs> there it is. So this is the Recode Project, which is additionally about looking at historical examples of um, artworks, comp computational artworks made by computers, um, and, in, and it's, there's a long history of this, way that dates way, way past, you know, what I've been doing for the last however many years and what, what people have been doing for me for the years before that. Um, and so this is a project where you, you click on any of these, for example, let's look at random squares. This is one we could probably do here by Charles Sussery. Um, you can see here is uh, direct translation and experimental. So I don't know if, if I click on this, does this mean we see the translation? Yeah. So this is that in written in processing and this is the artwork. So this, I would love to do something like this for the 12 o'clock's project. Um, okay. Um, so uh, thank you for that, Alka. I think I'm going to move on though, just in the interest of time, if that's okay. Um, so, um, uh, okay. So, we talked about those two things. Those are the two community projects. Straw poll. We can go back to that now because I really, it's, it's almost five o'clock and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm usually here till six or six or six thirty. I was kind of hoping to leave at six, but I, you know, I don't want to just only code for an hour. It's not very much time for this week. Um, so let me look at what's happening with the straw poll. Let's look at those results. I'm going to give you guys the last Last minute to, uh, to vote on, a, and I'm not necessarily going to do what it says, <laughs> but I'm going to consider it. Has Siraj released his video yet? He's downstairs working on it. Okay. I'm, I'm, so I'm going to view the results. Oh, look at this. Oh, it's nice to see simple harmonic motion. Wow. Wikipedia API, Latin var, vertex. Okay, great. Oh, nobody's interested in the 10 print. Is that because you don't know what 10 print is? I'm going to do the 10 print is great because I could do that probably as like a five minute coding challenge and it will inspire so many creative ideas. So uh, we're going to do that anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm not so sure about the continued matrix math, but it is useful to note the interest. And I'm just right now I'm trying to, it's, I know that there's a lot of viewers who are very experienced, not who have a lot of experience with a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, but there are also a lot of new people coming to learn about coding, and I really want to make this channel accessible, especially this time of year, which is September, when students are taking their first programming classes and that type of thing. Um, yeah, I didn't put machine learning on here explicitly. So, simple harmonic motion. Can I, can I do a warm-up? Is it okay? So let's, let me just commit to doing let and var. For <laughs> I feel like I need to. This, so I should have done this voting thing. Let. Okay. Let's. Um, hmm. Let's start with the simple. Let's. Let. Let me just do the let and var thing. Can I just do that as a warm up? I think. I think it'll be okay. 
Okay. Um, so let me get started here. Um, I am going to um, go to the desktop and I'm going to say p5 generate dash b um, let var const. Let's see if this works. So I'm using a new tool called p5 manager. I didn't actually publish that video, but I made a video about it which uh, will create p5 projects for me. And now I'm going to cd into that directory. I'm going to open it up in Atom. And I'm going to look at the code and I'm going to get rid of all the code. Uh, and I'm going to now run a server and go to the browser. Uh, okay, and let me just make sure this is working. If I make that change. There we go. Okay. And one thing I don't, this is sort of standard for P5 sketches, but I like to remove the default CSS that comes with them. There we go. And also there's no reason for me to have a canvas and the camera went off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, people are asking, why did you do the voting? Because I was curious. <laughs> I don't know, is voting really the best way to decide? It's a good way, it's, a, it's one way, but sometimes the universe has its own plan in mind. All right, so now I need a marker. I'm, I'm always unprepared, but I'm even more unprepared than usual. And I'm gonna do a video um, oh yeah, P5 mode in processing, I could use that. I'm gonna do a video, um, that's the whiteboard, that's me, about let and var and possibly const. Now here's the thing, I'm gonna to attempt to explain them and why, what, why, what let means in relation to var. You know, if you're a beginner and you're just learning to code, what do you know? Just say let. <laughs> but if you've been using var for a while, why is this, there this new let thing? On the one hand, you could just say, just use let instead of var. I'm going to say this again in a second, <laughs> thinking this through. And then I'm going to try to explain what let, how, why let is different and why it solves some problems in JavaScript, previous versions of the JavaScript language. Um, but I'm not really sure I know entirely what I'm talking about, which is, really goes for everything, but especially in this case. So, um, uh, yeah, can you guys hear people? There's people in the hallway. The door's not open, but um, uh, I will do, I'm going to do the simple harmonic motion next. This is a warm up uh, because I feel like I need to get warmed up because I'm, um, but um, I'm, if I make mistakes or I get this wrong, please correct me. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. First of all, it's very important to always make sure you stay hydrated. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Start over again. This is a video, sort of, about VAR. But this is a video about VAR in 2017. Now I should admit that I'm really way, way, way behind the times on this. Because in 2015, something came out called ES6. What is ES6? Well, ES6 is short for E. C, M, C, A, script, 2015. What's the chance that I got that right? Hold on a sec. <laughs> um, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong screen. Uh, what is it called? E, C, M, C, A, script? No. E, C, M, A. I got an extra C in there. <laughs> okay. This is an extra C. 
ECMA. It stands for something, some kind of consortium of mong mango loving astronauts. I don't know. But this is a consortium of people who come together to talk about what, what is the syntax of the JavaScript language and how should it work. And so in 2015, which is quite a while ago at this point, the, the, the consortium came together and thought, let's, instead of saying var to declare a variable, let's declare a variable, right? Instead of saying var x equals 100, let's declare a variable by saying let x equals 100. And also, quite possibly, let's offer an alternate option by saying const x equals 100. So currently, right now, if you were to write this into your code, all three of these would be valid JavaScript statements. But they would all do something slightly different. And I should also mention that one of the reasons why it's taken people like me years to get with the program is because even these aren't necessarily supported by every single web browser that people are using in the world. I think at this point, you know, most modern web browsers support ES6 natively. And if you're a web developer, there, a professional web developer, there are all sorts of ways to put something behind the scenes that, so that if somebody is, if the code is written in ES6, but the web browser doesn't support it, it works anyway. This is not the subject of this video, but this is a subject of, well, what are these things? There, and by the way, isn't there like ES8? Like I'm already way behind, so I'm like here making my ES6 video. Somebody in the future when it's like ES712 will be like amused by this old historical antiquated like video of this human being with actual like human body instead of robotic whatever. Anyway, I'm, I'm off track now. ES6 is a standard. I'm starting to use it in all of my videos. So. What is the difference and why? So I'm going to just tell you what the difference is in technical terms, and then I'm going to go and explain it. Var x uses something called block scope. And here's the thing. If you're just learning to program for the first time, you know, go watch the variable videos and just substitute let for var. If you're interested, if you've been programming for a while, you want to know what this new stuff is about, then this video is for you. Or if you just started learning to program and you really want to know this like level of detail, then I guess keep watching. Let x, oh my god, <laughs> I said it wrong. I did it totally wrong. Oh, by the way, there's like so many people watching this video who are just like screaming at their screen for like the last 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, var uses function scope. Let uses block scope. And if you program, if you learn to program in Java, hey, drop my, sorry, in Java, in C++, in processing, which is built on top of Java, and this is how I learned to program, everything was always block scope, and it's the only way that I think. I actually just, when I even use var, I'm just assuming it's block scope and writing code as if it is block scope, but it's not, and that's what's prone to error. And block scope, I personally mean, you know, I don't want to be too down on function scope. I'm sure function scope is a very nice scope, and I would love to hang out with function scope and have some time together, but I prefer block scope. Um, and so let's, let me get to the computer. This is way too long of a video to explain these two things. I can't believe you're watching this. Let me get to the computer and start to explain what I mean here. Okay, I'm over here. So I have some code and uh, I am going to start writing some code. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say var x equals 100, okay? I'm gonna say var x equals 100. I'm going to say console.log x, console.log x. This is like a weird example to start with and I'm gonna get to some examples that will hopefully help a little bit more, but what should happen when this code runs? Setup starts, this first line of code should execute. And what should it say? I don't know what x is. Are you nuts? I haven't heard about anything named x. Now I'm gonna say what x is, and if, the, if it was able to go onto the next line of code, it would say what x is, and then it would console log 100. But that's actually not what's gonna happen. I'm gonna hit refresh. All I care about is the console here. I got undefined in 100. Well, that's not so unreasonable, right? Because x is something that's undefined, but Shouldn't I really maybe possibly get an error there? Let's look what happens if I switch this now to let. 
uncaught reference error, x is not defined. So you might say, oh, well, I like the other way better because it didn't break. But here's the thing. The fact that it is not letting you talk about that variable above where it was declared and initialized is, uh, is, a, is, more, uh, is, is a situation which is less prone to error. Let me show you some reasons why. So first of all, one thing that's interesting is I could do this, let x. Then I could say x equals 100. And then I could put the console log here. This would now give me exactly what var did. So why? Why? What, what's going on here? Well, there's something in JavaScript with var called hoisting. Hoisting. I'm so proud of myself for knowing what hoisting is because there was a long period of time where people would say, I'm like, I don't know what that is. But now I do, I think, and I'm going to explain it. So if I'm hoisting, what is hoisting? So I'm going to write some other code. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say for var, I, I'm going to use var, i equals zero, i is less than 100, i plus plus, I'm going to write a loop, and I'm going to, like, some stuff will happen here. And then I'm going to say uh, var x equals mouse x plus 100. And then I'm going to say if x is greater than 50, then var z equals 20. And y e and, and, uh, and then draw an ellipse, uh, you know, whatever, var y at x comma y 100, 100. So this is sort of nonsense code, but I'm, I'm writing this code to make a point. <laughs> there is a point. When you write code like this in ES5, previous to ES6 in JavaScript, what the interpreter actually reads, your code is actually modified before it runs. It does this thing called hoisting, and it actually does this. I don't think, right? And then I'm going to take out, it, it adds like a line of code at the top of the function that declares all the variables, and then deletes all the variable declarations. So, this is, why, this is why those variables with var, those variables with var have function scope. Because even though if I declare var down here, var y equals 20, the hoisting process puts the declaration at the top, and it's a variable that's available for the whole, for the entire uh, function setup. It has function scope, even though it's declared and only used inside of this if statement. So I can say things like console log y up here, and I can do things like console log i at the bottom. So I'm going to get undefined because y doesn't have a value yet. And then I'm going to get, what am I going to get down here? Console log 100 because that loop is going to have finished and left i with the value 100. So that's exactly what I got and even drew part of that ellipse. And then, so technically, like this code is sort of problematic because I've declared two variables. I've hoisted two variables called i. Right? So now, the, uh, so this, is really the, this is really the issue. This hoisting process, which happens behind the scenes and lets variables be available to a broader scope beyond where they are actually declared and used, uh, makes, makes code prone to error, at least in my experience. So, you know, for example, if I'm writing a loop here, if I simplify this, like, and I want to have a separate variable for i somewhere else, I'm really just, I'm running into trouble. The fact that I can actually use this variable i afterwards, is there's all these problems that could happen by accident if I had another variable that was more global called i, and the scope can get really confused. So, I should probably redo this video. <laughs> so, using let is a nice solution to this problem. Now, I don't know so why is it called let versus var? I mean, in my understanding of this is, well, why not just change the behavior of var? Well, if you change the behavior of var, then you're possibly going to break all this code that has been written over time. So in order to write, in order to have a new version of JavaScript that has variables that only have block scope, block scope, they're only available within whatever curly brackets they're declared in, whether that's if, whether that's for, a new name has to be invented. So we just have to all change over and say like, now let's just all use let. Let's use let. I can't remember, but let's use let. Let's use let. Let's use let. I'm going to use let. I'm going to use let. Let. Again, 
This video could have been made 30 seconds by me just saying, hey, remember that thing called var? It's called let now. But there is actually a technical difference, and let's look at that again. Right, right now, I'm going to run this code, and we see 100. I console log i as 100. If I change this to let, I will get an error. i is not defined, and that's the error that I want. i is only available inside of this block. This is the block. <laughs> that's the block. I has block scope. If I put an if statement in here, if mouse x is greater than 20, let j equal 20, console log j, I will get an error here because j is only available for this. And you want your variables to only be available for, I mean, sometimes you need global variables. I'm not saying all variables should have the littlest scope as possible, but they should have the smallest scope that is needed. It helps you organize your code, helps you be less prone to error. I mean, making errors is fun. Everybody should make errors, but this is a helpful thing. Okay. <sighs> what do you guys think? Did I explain that? What questions do you have? I guess write them in the comments. Um, and ah, I didn't get to talking about what const is. So let me try to let me try to talk about in a separate video in the next video what const is. And if there's anything that I missed or some questions, there's a live chat going on right now. If you're watching this as an edited video later, if there's anything that I missed, I'm going to go check that live chat and talk about it at the beginning of the next video. And there's a lot more ES6 stuff that I want to talk to talk about. So there's uh, classes and there's promises. So I want to get to that stuff eventually. But I just wanted to talk about in this video, let. All right, how did I do? <laughs> I should do a straw poll. Like that was, like on a scale of one to 10, that was a useful and interesting video that made sense. I would give myself like a three and a half, but uh, maybe you'll be more generous to me. Um, okay, um, I'm looking to see if there's any questions. Question, when are you going to harmonic motion? After I talk about const. Super interesting and clear. Thank you, Guillaume. That's, I'm glad to hear that. Um, 8 out of 10, so 7 out of 10. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Fun, fun out of 10. 10. Oh, you guys are much too nice. You know, I'm just saying this because I need the positive uh, feedback. Great, thank you guys. Okay, so I think I should move on. Um, I don't think I, did I get anything horribly wrong? Did I miss any crucial details? It doesn't seem like I did. Um... All right, I'm so, okay, I'm gonna, thank you for all those comments. All right, I'm gonna move on and talk about const. This is I'm probably gonna, more likely to get wrong. Okay, I'm back for another video about stuff that's in ES6. Again, if you're just watching my beginner programming videos and just learned about programming, you might just go back to watching those. This is a little bit of behind the scenes stuff, very technical, but it is interesting and it can be useful. The thing that I wanna talk, I talked in the previous video about let and var and the difference between those two things. And you know, you could, for most sketching that I'm gonna do in P5 and making create weird experiments, I could use them interchangeably and not worry about it too much. But there is another uh, term that you're going to see you're going to see people say var x if they are using a uh, style previous to ES6 or 2015 um, ECMA script. You're going to see let if people are using ES6, a more modern style of JavaScript. But you're also going to see people using const. And what does const mean? Now, there is no reason you have to ever use const ever. I mean, somebody I'm sure will come up with a reason why you, you might have to. But what I'm saying is for the things that I'm making, I could just use let but my code is perhaps a little less efficient in the way that it runs and uses memory. So const is only an option to help with the efficiency of how your program runs and manages memory on the computer. Because if you have some data, if you have a variable in your program that you know its value is never going to change, the computer can be, more, can be smart about how it stores that information. It doesn't have to like leave extra space for extra stuff. Now I'm kind of oversimplifying, but that I think is a useful way to think about it. So for example, if I know that I want to have a variable called cat and I want to store in it the number 99, I don't need to say let cat if cat is never going to have another value ever. I can say const for constant because cat is going to be a constant. Now here's the interesting thing. 
This makes sense when it comes to just numbers, but there's more to it than that. What if you're declaring a function? Or what if you're declaring an object? So let's at least first look at the simple, simple scenario of working with numbers. So I'm going to come back over here. And all of this I can do just in the JavaScript console in the browser itself. So if I say let x equal 50, can you guys see this? Let me make it a little bigger. Um, now I can look at the value of x, and the value of x is 50. And I can say x equals 100, and now the value of x is 100. Let's do this again. Let's say const y equals 50. So now I have a variable called y, which is a const, constant, and its value is 50. Now I'm going to say y equals 100, uncaught type error assignment to a constant variable. So you cannot assign to a constant variable. You cannot reassign the value. It's forever 50. So I, was, I feel like I need to go back to the whiteboard, but I don't think I do. So what does this mean in terms of objects? It's a little bit strange, and I'm not sure I fully understand this behavior, so I might have to like, come back to this a little bit. <laughs> and I'm seeing Alka putting some interesting suggestions in the uh, chat here. Um, okay, so let's look at what if I say, what if I have like a particle? Constant particle, and the particle has an x and a y. So it's really a JavaScript object. Oh, I made it const. That's fine. We know what it's going to do when it's let particle equal. It's just an object like anything. So this is what it is. It's an object. It has an x and a y. It's a constant. But interestingly enough, when you make an object a constant, that doesn't mean you can't manipulate the inner workings of the object. Like I can actually say particle.x equals 200, and that is totally valid. So I can change those internal variables because those internal variables themselves are not constant. I can even do things like, which surprised me when I first saw this, I can say particle.z equals 50 which means I can add another property to that object. But what I can't do is I can't now say particle equals, I'm going to recreate a new object. I'm going to recreate that object. Uncaught error, assignment to a constant variable. I cannot suddenly say particle is now the string hello. This protects me from making some errors, too, because if I'm using a variable, I can't reassign it by accident to something of a different type. So I can't make it a new object. So again, I could use let, but this is something that allows the code perhaps to run a bit faster, to use a little bit less memory. So if you know that this is, a, and maybe to protect yourself against some errors. So this is a useful technique. And mostly I'm explaining this because when you look at examples, you're going to see it. And a place where you'll see it often, at least where I see it often, is um, sorry, I want to erase. I only have these tissues to erase with. Let, Mathieu, maybe let's edit out this erasing or like speed through it or something. Um, I, can't, I also can't use my right hand for erasing. The way that I, in my, most of my videos, and the way that I've shown how to declare a function is saying function, you know, uh, uh, go, like this. This is a function definition. I say function, the name of the function, parentheses with whatever arguments are in there. This is the equivalent of basically saying var go equals function. Or of course now we know it's actually the equivalent of saying let go equal function if I'm using ES6. So if I'm declaring all these functions, if I'm writing functions into my code, it's often the case that I never want to reassign or alter that function. That function is done. It's a function I'm just intending to use in my code. So you will see this quite a bit. Const go equals function. So you could consider this, again, this is a lot. Now let me type this over here so you can see it. So in other words, what I'm saying is, let's say I'm going to have some functions. Function go, that's one way of declaring a function the way that I typically have done in my videos but I can say const go equals function. So again, while this might offer some optimization benefits, it doesn't necessarily offer a lot of benefits for teaching and education, especially for beginning programming, which is why I will continue to use the top syntax. Because if I'm going to teach somebody for the first time ever how to write a function, const go equals function is a bit more uh, probably confusing than just function go. So I think that's, um, 
everything I should say. I'm going to pa oh, pause for a second. <laughs> Siraj just released his video because I got a notification. This should just kind of edit this out. Um, did I miss anything about const? Mm, that's important. How does const affect scope? Good question. I assume const uses block scope also. So there was actually just an important question in the chat just now. I talked a lot about scope in the previous video and I probably want to, in some ways now that I think I probably should have made a video just only about the idea of scope. But um, what, how does const affect scope? So const also uses block scope. Let and const both use block scope the same exact way. The difference is const is a variable that can never be reassigned. Um, <laughs> uh, Chuck's Pie in the chat is asking, where can I learn all this stuff? I, I think probably my beginner JavaScript series is where you can start from scratch. Okay, I think this is good. I'm not seeing anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not just const go? Yeah, so I'm not using the arrow syntax yet. So let me mention that. So one thing I should mention is <laughs> actually in ES6, there's also another way of declaring a function that involves equal greater than, and almost it looks like an arrow. This is called the arrow syntax. I'm not using this yet. I will come back and make a video about this. So you, I could go even a step further with how I might declare a function by incorporating this arrow syntax, but I'm not ready for that yet. I gotta take little tiny steps into the ES6 pool. Okay, thanks for watching these, this, this video about const. I hope this helped. Please ask your questions and offer your corrections in the comments, and I'll see you soon. Thanks. Is that called the lambda expression? Oh. I'm just being told this is called the lambda expression. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So we got those out of the way. That's some good stuff that I've done that's been on my list for a while. Um, and now um, what I'm going to actually do is rename this folder Simple Harmonic Motion. Rename, maybe it won't let me do that. Okay, let me just, don't save. Uh, let me move this over here. You can talk amongst yourselves for a second. Go watch Siraj's video. <laughs> uh, is this still the same results here? Uh, okay, what are we at? 5.30? Oh, we're doing okay. Um, so I got this one done. We can take this one off. Simple harmonic motion. Uh, I'm looking for my, uh, this one. I'm just going to call this. I don't need to. Simple harmonic motion. And one thing I'm going to show you is um, if you're familiar with Memo Atkin, the artist, mm, I'm going to spell the name, simple harmonic, that Google will correct me. Uh, yeah, here we go. So this is a wonderful series of artworks and Uh, um, sorry, I am trying to run my server again. Um, this is a series of artworks about simple harmonic motion. Um, and it's sort of the inspiration for what you can do with this very simple idea. Um, I'm also going to look for... So one thing I want to do is just search on YouTube. Simple harmonic motion shiftman. <laughs> so I might already have. Oh, look at that. <laughs> um, so apparently, I have a video tutorial already, but I don't think that I code anything from scratch in this one. Let's, and this one only has like eight and a half thousand views because it's one of my old videos. Let's quickly take a look at this, scan through it. No, 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 ignore the ad, ignore the ad, ignore the ad. I apologize, I apologize. Skip, skip. So you guys can't hear the video right now. I could switch something to have you hear it. So I'm explaining about sine and cosine. Then I already have some code example. I'm just showing code examples and talking about them. So that's useful, but it's also in processing. So this is worthwhile. Look at me. Look how, look how young I am in this video. I have the same beard, different glasses, different glasses, and very, very little gray hair. 
and I don't have an elbow scar. <laughs> and I have much, much uh, more range of motion. Okay, now you guys don't need to care about this. Okay. Okay, go away, younger person, you. Okay. Um, making YouTube videos really ages a person, let me tell you. <laughs> That's, I think, from two, I think I made those videos possibly in 2012. So I'm not sure. Uh, um, all right. Let's, okay. So what I want to do, I kind of want to just basically do this. But I also need an array. Maybe I'll do this in two parts. All right. This is going to be a pretty simple one. And actually, probably, um, these have wonderful sound that you won't hear. Okay. A DNA strand. <laughs> all right. All right. All right, everybody. Relax. 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 <laughs> Me. I'm talking to myself here. I'm going to drink. Stay hydrated. It was really nice to see everybody's feedback about Yuning's guest tutorial that I released. Um, she has a... Whoop. Oh, I'm streaming, but... I don't see myself. You can hear me though, right? Uh oh. Hold on, everybody. Why? You can hear me, but you can't see me. I restarted the computer. I still can't see me. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, you can hear me. Um, let me look at this. No. Why am I not seeing any of the black magic inputs? No, still can't see me. All right, everybody, hold on a second. Let me try to diagnose this. Uh, just give me a second. I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have started streaming until I knew it was working. Um, Let me, oh, I found myself, found myself. So now you can see me, I'm in the void. How do I get the, so let me, so that's here. I'm gonna delete this. I don't know why when I restarted the computer, all the inputs weren't showing up. Crazy how I have to redo this stuff when, uh, while I'm streaming. Weird. All right. I don't understand why these black magic things are the bane of my existence. Uh, Sorry, everybody, this must be excruciating to watch. Mm. Here I am. All right, I'm going to try restarting OBS, I guess. Oh, no, but I have to quit to do that. Uh, oh, that works. <laughs> no, I don't think this is OBS's fault. I think this is black magic. Uh, hold on, let me make sure this is actually on. 
it is. And do I see it? See it? Sorry, everybody. I'm going to attempt to. Uh, Sorry, I don't want to uh, just be streaming the not working thing. I thought I just was, I, cl I clicked the streaming button really quickly because I thought like I just restart and start streaming again because the computer froze. But I'm going to uh, need to restart OBS to try to reconnect to the stuff. So I'm going to stop streaming. <laughs> hopefully I'll come back. I mean, I, I will come back no matter what, but hopefully I'll come back quickly. <laughs>